Uh, now I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker. We have a, a great keynote speaker, Dr. Masoud Murtazawi, who is going to talk to us about uh, um, uh, the title of his uh, keynote is the Data Foundries, the Cold Drone of the IoT Clouds and Data Centers. Uh, just to give you a, a brief bio about Dr. Masoud, Dr. Masoud Murtazawi is a distinguished engineer and the senior director of IT research department at Hayway Technologies here in the U.S. in Santa Clara. Uh, earlier, Dr. Masoud was a senior principal architect uh, at Yahoo's cloud infrastructure group. He led multiple advanced projects related to automated elasticity, uh, elasticity systems, cloud services architecture, automatic, uh, automatic and adaptive controllers for scalability of infrastructure services, multi petabyte distributed databases structured and unstructured storage, scalable messaging and application container services. He has published and spoken internationally on NoSQL databases, multi-tenancy, big data, and privacy. Uh, Dr. Masoud led an inter international group of engineers at Sun Microsystem focused on the development of open source software, including databases such as Apache Derby, and MySQL. At Hayways Innovation Center in Santa Clara, uh, Dr. Masoud leads now uh, a team of researchers focused on the next generation data centers, uh, distribu distributed system databases, file system, and digital archives. Without no further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Masoud to, to deliver his keynote. I, um, Dr. Sala, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here and have this opportunity to talk to you. We did have some glitches. Okay, magic worked. Um, right, it's showing up. Okay, so uh, when I suggested this title, uh, Ali told me that's the kind of a strange set of words to you. What's a foundry? Just, I just like those words. <laughs> um, and um, just a, I, I work at the Huawei R&D Center and um, dig in and see a little bit about Huawei. Um, of course, people, I, I see a lot of people here from Europe, Middle East, places. In the U.S., uh, Huawei is not really a very recognized brand, although I do hold the next uh, Google XP phone. Huawei, it's the second version, test version of testing. Um, it was released a few weeks ago, so that hopefully will bring more recognition to the company here. But we are an international company. It's uh, held collectively by the employees and largest, uh, one of the largest uh, technology firms privately by the employees. The outline of the talk is that I, I will give a bit of a background, what I mean, discuss those two words, 
I'll, I'll talk to you a bit about the kinds of trade-offs that have come about when looking at applications of large data centers. And then discuss a bit the, the present situation here historically. Of course, we all know that data is growing rapidly, the volume of data. Here's a presentation from one of my colleagues. I grabbed it from Twitter presentation. I liked it. This shows the different uh, familiar services, the volume of data slowing in. This might be from last couple of years. Um, and in, in 2015, if you go and do a search on trends, one of the words that is most often searched on Wikipedia is IoT, Internet of And McKinsey actually published a pretty deep study, IoT, which they looked at 300 different applications and looked at nine areas and essentially what came out of that is that 40% of the value that IoT has depends on being able to integrate different IoT systems. The estimated value that they came up with was 3.9 to 11 trillion dollars 2025 with billions of devices, 50 billion devices. Uh, but one of the things they noticed is that most of this value is in B2B type applications. Thirds of it is applications. And um, by the way, I should, I should mention that they studied 300 different applications to come up with these concepts. And also the value that they've measured depends, you know, they're, they're calculating total captured value. They're estimating the amount of time people save in, in making themselves to work and turning that into dollar values. That's the type of methodology they used to estimate this. Uh, when it comes to IoT, if you look at this IDC, famous IDC hype cycle, we are very early in the cycle. Um, only enterprise manufacturing industries are moving up to the what they call plateau of productivity. All the other applications are still either early innovation time, thinking of them, or have reached some kind of peak of expectation or in the falling into disillusionment. Big data noted the ones fast going to pass disillusionment. Um, it's interesting to study this curve because it also has this used to be a concept called crossing the chasm where you would develop some idea that somebody to use try to have more people use it. You always had this barrier that you had to go through. Uh, parallels. Uh, these are kind of concepts that I'm touching on so that the rest of the talk could have some. Uh, another concept I wanted to touch on early on is concept of age of data. Is as data grows, store it. We also throw a lot of data away. And we can start talking about longevity of how long data lives. It turns out that when you look at monitoring, um, actually data that has uh, higher fidelity seems to be evicted from storage tier before the data that has lower fidelity. I'll give you an example. Many monitoring systems keep uh, five-second averages, core utilization for a week, but it, it might keep one-minute averages, five months, one-day average, or longer than that. So um, fidelity, you know, data that is more, have high, very high fidelity, seems to be put away faster. 
You can also think of this as monitoring system, video monitoring. High definition video monitoring happen for the 48 hours. You keep that data. Lower the And then there are some questions that come up. You know, what is the best way to keep this high fidelity data? Should you be indexing it? Should you be putting it? How much of it should you put in the storage? There are issues of value that come up, issue analysis. We do analytics on All that puzzle. Now, looking at uh, the words I started with, uh, here are a couple of pictures from Foundry in England where they're building, they're making bells, they're melting iron bells and 100 year old foundry in Germany that just rec I read just recently uh, got an upgrade. Last time he had an upgrade was 1911. They live for a long time. I heat, turn them into new. I think that this is what is going on in data center today with data. And I will give you some numbers and examples. That Caldron is the, the pot, magician, mixes various things, creates some sort of magical potion. And uh, I, I would argue that some of the hype goes on with uh, big data or analytics. Um, is, you know, some of the folks are thinking of their systems a magical caldron where they could mix uh, data, do analysis, and new facts or ideas of ocean that would fix diseases. Now, where does this energy for these uh, big caldrons of found come from? Um, there was a journalist, American journalist, his name is Ginger Strand, who did research, actually wrote a book about energy production, water, water flow, like dams and generators depend on flow of water. And she discovered, she, she wasn't really looking into data centers, but she ran into this case where in Oregon, the government of Oregon actually gave a 50, I'm sorry, $85 billion subsidy. The Bonville, you might not be able to see this, but just to tell you in 2005, government of Oregon gave $85 billion energy subsidy, the Bonville Power Administration. And this is about the time when Google actually bought land, started a data center there and many other uh, companies have large data centers started placing one of their many geographic. Um, there have also been publications that look at how this energy is spent within the data center. It's interesting. A lot of it, of course, goes to the CPU. That's the black. The red is the RAM. The yellow is the disk and some kind of other. If you look at that, you also, uh, we'll, we'll get to this team earlier about how different stores trade off energy speed. Uh, of course, there are other examples of data center, Data centers. So one of the ones that I found quite interesting was Yahoo's green lockport facility relies on natural convection, cool data center, ancient method for cooling in general. We have water flows and and towers create a gradient for natural convection to take hold. You look at the architecture, the actual architecture with it's very classical. We used to draw this in DARPA presentations to motivate funding for different things. Actually, this comes probably from a DARPA slide from 20 years ago. Almost all systems have these elements in them. Uh, and 
data center is being simple, distributed, I shouldn't say simple, um, instance of a distributed operating system has all of these compute, data, network, monitoring. I won't speak too much about network. Huawei, of course, is a networking company. But uh, consider my What is happening, though, is that in these large data centers, either to, uh, to save energy, save networking costs, new interesting topological systems, physical topology deployed. Facebook had an article, a very brief article about working a few years ago, describing how they're going to fancier way of physical connectivity. Uh, wiring systems have been studied for a very long time. Very interesting old papers from old 18, pre-18 telephone networks before they had the automatic switches. Somehow automatic switches pause this wiring studies and they're coming up again. And people have to dig in to find very old papers, this 1936 by somebody in college. He makes references to some German study going back to 1916. All of this was motivated question of how to best wire a network. Um, so going back to the concept of foundries, of course these data centers asked data in multitude of forms. Get into this. And they deal with much higher data inside the data center side. One of the facts that is emerging that if you look at any data center, uh, the events that actually exit and in are, are lower in actually unfold within the data center. Uh, the data forms are, I'll just give a few examples. Of when data enters, the data logged, replicate, is in the, is serialized in various formats to be placed on hot, warm, cold, cool, and eventually cold storage. And all of this is volatile. Some of them persist very long system, variable, and we will look into what I call event amplification. There's a great example of it given in a presentation on LinkedIn, Oscafo, which we did, started a startup there, some fun, but uh, Kafka is this, of a scalable messaging logging system. Very popular of companies. By the way, these logging and messaging systems that carry data within data center have not really been the subject of a lot of papers that published by by or who have example first infrastructure publication of GFS. I don't believe they had much about their method. They might have publication. Uh, but what you note here in the number that was given by people who put this presentation together was actually last month, messaging in the Silicon Valley. Uh, they measured the number of messages that actually come to Kafka and it published. Now, sometimes some of the applications that consume messages from Kafka, they publish it into Kafka. So that 800 billion that you see is actually much larger than the messages that have come into LinkedIn. It's far fewer than that per day. 
uh, but you can see that there's a huge amplification there. At least here it shows a factor of three. Uh, the numbers are actually closer to 100. As I said, Kafka publishes to it. Uh, this is also a very tightly kept number. I think it would be very interesting if one day we compare data, you know, applications or data center, Facebook, other, WeChat, or China version of other applications, and measure the number of events that actually go into the data center and compare it to the number are within the data. And you could call that a message amplification and then try to understand how different applications, what is the optimal message amplification? Or whether one application or one organization is data center suboptimal point. This is a, uh, this would be an interesting research question. I think. Now, let's get back and try to understand why is it that these amplifications actually happen. And I, I'm, I'm just going to kind of open the window here. And I, unfortunately, I don't think get too deeply in it. Give you enough ideas. Uh, it all begins, the story all begins from here. At, it's a very simple diagram. Users usually abandon slow services. This has been proven, it was proven in search. Before Google, there were many other search companies. They all kind of disappeared. This was both about quality or about responsiveness. A lot of dot-com companies were born in fact, we probably had our first social networking application back in mid 90s, late mid 1996 or 7. But um, they kind of disappeared because they couldn't scale. And the reason they couldn't scale is that as more people came in, it just became impossible to have good responsiveness. Many uh, web experts believe that good responsiveness is of the order of 100 milliseconds. In some applications, it turns out to be even lower than that. For example, when you work on a Google Doc and share it with somebody else, responsiveness has to be even lower than that. So what was the problem? Why did these early kind of web companies were unable to solve this problem? It just happened that you know they had generally two tiers. They had a web tier, then they had persistent tier, the persistent tier made their data more durable, was much slower. And the problem was that if you connected these two tiers together, sequence, your latencies will go up. At some point, the database won't be able to handle all the requests, all the transactional updates. You would go out and buy a bigger machine, and a bigger machine, and a bigger machine. In fact, this was one reason my earlier company, Sun Microsystem Company, I worked before, became very successful. I joined them in early 1999, and there were days that I was, I was going to work, coming back, and they hadn't given me a lot of shares, but the shares they'd given me were making me m much more money than my salary that day, which is very pleasant. Uh, and all of it was this for, because of massive purchase of machines. But then many of them just, just cannot scale vertically. Um, they, they went down, the sun went down, <laughs> my stocks were worth nothing. But um, this, was a, this was a common story. So how did they end up solving this problem, companies that actually succeeded? Uh, they used what we call partition durable stores with acceptable latency. It's a middle tier. And the middle tier characteristic times are somewhere between the web tier and the database. But, uh, and this middle tier is the one that I talked to you earlier, it's the logging, durable logging system. And it's generally partition scalable. 
And the way it works is that it has less structure. When you write data in, um, you don't put any structure for finding that data. You just have to. And then asynchronously at a later time, replicate it back in. This is done out of band from serving the uh, user request. Of course, I've grossly simplified the architecture of web applications. Read papers from, particularly like Facebook has very good descriptions of web architecture. And haven't shown caches, shown indexing. But the point is that you introduce this tier that, that negotiates the latency mismatches that you have in your system. But once you introduce this tier, you already are multiplying the event or data center. Um, the story doesn't really end here <clears throat> because of course, those asynchronous messages have to be consumed very quickly. That gave birth to NoSQL databases. Then NoSQL databases, you can't really do complex queries on them. Gave birth to indexing systems, large data processing, Hadoop and others. Um, and it goes on and on. And then as your data builds up, uh, you are wondering whether you're using your disks properly and start thinking about perhaps you should consume less energy. And that gives rise to pool storage, where you are selectively turning some disks on, and some of them off, spinning some, stopping others. And then cold storage, where you put things in systems like Amazon Glacier, Blu-ray storage that Facebook archival, digital archive that our lab is working on uh, because they actually consume even storage. Uh, this technology wasn't just used to, to reduce latency mismatches. Once people started using these partition durable logs, scalable dual, they also discovered that using proper APIs would also help. So this comes from a presentation, ApacheCon, by people who developed Kafka at LinkedIn. Uh, the top is the uh, of LinkedIn circa 2004, bottom. LinkedIn 2010. Um, and the system that you see here is this logging system in the middle that uh, Ofka, that uh, allows applications to, to program to topics instead of endpoints. By having kind of a topic-based pub subsystem, you uh, greatly simplify programming sort of connectivity, I want to say logical connect systems. This doesn't mean that the physical con there's any reduction in physical con Another view of the same uh, same system and the simplification. Uh, so up to now we spoke about storage, when it comes to compute tiers, there's also been a great advance. People have been using different techniques. Uh, VMware has been advertising vSphere as a solution for compute tier and later versions of others have different systems. In our lab, what we did uh, five years ago, build a whole many clusters that are based on Linux containers and have them run a separate network while we had 
the administrative systems running network of their own. So we kind of separated the data net administration and monitoring. And you know, we were experimenting with this, and I think we built this with perhaps uh, 20 scripts, 20 actual command line. Developers come to me, give their Linux content, 20 commands, get them, cluster 50 LXCs they could experiment with, cluster. And uh, so work, I knew back then that working with containers was great. Five years ago, he didn't want it. VMs. Now, this trend has taken hold in the industry. Earlier this year in Eurosys, in March, Google published org uh, system for managing containers clusters. I really encourage you to read that paper. Very fine description of what they've done. By the way, we also had a project called Borg at Huawei five years ago. It was about an entirely different system, the Borg database. We also have the cluster database earlier, a bit earlier, called BorgDB. But uh, this Borg is about managing containers and resources, compute resources. And last year, uh, Google also released a thing called Kubernetes, or contributing to it, an open source project. Uh, kind of a thinner version of what Google actually runs. Probably has about a third of the features, maybe less. When you do a Hello World application, Kubernetes, your Hello World application could be, whereas the Hello World application work system, 30 minutes. All of that is thinner, and the services that are wrapped around your Hello World. Um, this uh, Kubernetes or Borg system also has competition in the academia. The Meso system that was developed at UC Berkeley, again, earlier this year, Apple uh, uh, announced that with a theory system, actually use Mesos to distribute uh, load theory containers in its data center. Theory is actually a very advanced system, and perhaps when Kubernetes was released, was to come. Uh, I'm sorry, not Siri, but Mesos, very advanced system. Maybe Kubernetes was released to compete to also wrap some in a way. Clear to me. Of course, we do all this computation for a purpose because we need to give some significance to the data that we have, so like the data to the computation, analyze it. This axis is hard to read in the back, goes from data to wisdom, second, and there are vertical lines. The second line is content, just data plus metadata. The third line is information, is uh, content plus institutions, and you have knowledge, which is information plus persons, expertise, which is press actually taking action. You have wisdom, which is sort of living life. Uh, uh, there's a lot of discussion about how far analysis can take us. I think it would perhaps take us someplace between information and knowledge and farther than that. Um, but this is still, you know, as you saw how the big data pipe curve going down sort of disillusionment, give you a little bit more disillusionment before we go to the other part of the talk. In minutes left. Shit. <laughs> uh, so uh, this concept of actually learning from big data has its own limits. A paper published by a med doctors, these are doctors of medicine in work. Dr. David Olson, what he did was compare Google's flu prediction with the actual Center for Disease Control flu data. Center for Disease Control actually has the flu data from the United States, from hospitals. It collects serial data, 
uh, and Google does predictions based on prediction four. It does big, big data analysis. And it, it, it seems if these two, uh, if Google data fell on the line that is 45 degrees, uh, it would have perfect prediction. And these different colors go to different years. And as you can see, as you go from the United States to New York City, wider and wider. New York is not a very small place. But just uh, mid-Atlantic states, uh, North Carolina, New York, um, has less variance, but not much less than the United States. And it turns out that the Google prediction has actually been underestimated the 2009 pandemic, it overestimated, that's the blue and the red line. Red is from 2009, blue is from 2013. It overestimated in 2013, and it seemed to have a slightly better prediction in 2010, 12. We wonder what is going on as we're advancing. It could be that the, their models are becoming more complex. Perhaps they're using more dimensions. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, computer scientists don't really have training in statistics. So they end up using, you know, add more parameters, model was more complex. Perhaps I would get something more accurate. Well, that is just not true. Uh, because it turns out if you look at model dimensions, parameters, and distribute a bunch of data points, dimensions. Uh, you can think of a hypersphere. Uh, most of your data is going to be near the surface of that sphere. Very little of it is going to be in the center. It makes a lot of uh, an analytic techniques, k-means machine learning, really hard to do in traditional systems. In fact, if you have one dimension, and this is um, interesting because usually when they do surveys in the US of people's choices for presidential candidates, they go with a thousand people. And I always wondered why that was. And they, they come at the very bottom, they say, well, the, the accuracy of this result is 3%. But it, you know, it turns out accuracy, if everything was distributed in a Gaussian form, accurate predicted probability parameters is one over the square of data points. If you have, you want to have 10% accuracy, you should have at least 100 samples of Gaussian function. You, now, if your model has 10 dimensions, you would need 100 to the power of 10 data points to actually get the same accuracy. It is massive. I don't think even Google has that much data. So um, maybe they do, I don't know. But uh, what I wanted to say is that sometimes these predictive techniques are overplayed. And this is one reason where people say, okay, even if I have big data, I have really fast networks. Maybe my algorithms don't matter, maybe less optimized algorithm, I'll, I'll get away. Latency doesn't matter. I've partitioned parallel out. I have even more data. Finally, I get things right. For the rest of the presentation, I want to do two things. First of all, I want to talk about power algorithms. Now, it, it is impossible to get I.O. not to cost anything because we're dealing with physical systems. Somebody came to me when I told him this. What if we do quantum computing? You know? <laughs> well, it's not here yet. I don't quite understand it. And when Einstein talked about quantum communication, he really posed it as a, as a puzzle. He didn't say it is possible. Puzzle. People believe it is possible. I don't know enough quantum physics to it is or not. But um, you know, costless communication. Latency communication, not there. In fact, you have these hierarchies of caches, 
discs and rams and we, we just went over them uh, and even in Google this, this is a very small number I'll tell you what it is it is Jeff Dean Google's fellow and you know, the guy who leads their infrastructure saying you every engineer should know all the latency for all the IO devices that's essentially what he's saying and he's listing them here and as you go down see those numbers are becoming larger and larger going from the L1 cache on the CPU all the way to disk and sending packets from California to Holland. Okay? So, and they were all given in nanoseconds by sending packets from California to Netherlands. You can't see it here. It's 150 million nanoseconds. Accessing the cache is 0.5 nanoseconds. Okay? So, and, and, and branch misprediction costs you 5 nanoseconds. That's the second line below the L1 cache. Well, it turns out that when it comes to analytics, it's exactly branch misprediction. That's the cause of the problem. So you have to do <laughs> lots of systems that are being built to not do branching. Oh, just to save that. Okay, so algorithms matter. The way you write your code matters. And uh, you just cannot have zero I.O. There are trade-offs. Uh, there was a famous, you know, there's a famous of triangle, Brewer triangle, or Brewer, uh, some people say hypothesis, some people say conjecture, some people say theorem, and then they fight about whether it is worth calling it a theorem or not. But there is a trade-off between consistency and Want to be available, you have to have replicas. Getting replicas to be consistent is hard, so there's a trade-off there. And there's also a trade-off between performance and durability. I think I've been put, you know, talking about that, emphasizing that throughout the talk. And, and this trade-off, uh, you can't really get away from it. More performant devices like your L1 caches are um, you know, less durable and so on. So, but I want to show you the extremes. And I think you can put, I only put two points here, the RAM and the Blu-ray. Blu-ray is very durable. But there's not just performance that's traded off. It seems to be power that's also traded off as well. If you have something that you put on some data that you put on some very on a media that's very durable, it seems that you will your systems would spend less energy to keep it there. That's just the way the system works. The system architecture works. And you can go and look at all of them. And you always come to this. Um, Blu-ray is an example of it. You can have access to 10,000 gigabytes, 7 watts. Power over, have a peta, multiple petabytes of data, Blu-ray array, access 10 gigabytes over the year, 1% of it. You'll be spending seven. If you wanted to keep 10,000 gigabytes uh, active in your RAM, it would be with kilowatts. Now, durability and power efficiency exemplified. I'm Robbie Stella. I always like to go back to the presentations into one of them before you. Uh, Hammurabi Stella was the first recorded law half Mesopotamia. I know it looks strange, but it's actually a thumb the idea. Um, um, one half of it is contract law, one, one third of it is family law, and the rest of it is about institutions, military, government. From old Babylonian period, that's 4,000 years ago, written very simple languages, four columns, 28 paragraphs. Um, and in any case, um, it actually lived for 3,100 years of its life, Chusha, present day Iran. Um, and then it was moved by a Frenchman to Louvre. But, you know, it's very durable. And I think in the 4,000 years of life it has had, 
it has spent no energy whatsoever. And of course, there was a lot of energy spent to move it around and to keep taking care of it. But that wasn't necessary. It would be buried under the ground for another thousand years. Know about it. And it would still have the laws under. There are issues about how to look at the laws and how to examine them. What they did during Hammurabi's time was that they also put these laws on clay tablets and sent them around so people can look at them. Um, so there's this concept of um, durability, performance, durability, power, spend to keep data. But it, it turns out that most of the low latency work that we do, interactive web, they really just help us react in time. But, and most of the high latency access digital archive. You know, it used to take me about an hour to go find the books I needed at Berkeley Library 25 years ago. And it takes me about a few hours to get my books glacier service in Google. Books, keeping it. I mean, in, in or the digital archive. My lab is there. Um, and energy matters in activities. And the question is, what? Part, what I mean, one of the questions is, what part of which part of the system? And also in the reactive part, one of the questions is. What are we spending our energy on? What kind of questions are we trying to answer? So, for example, in 2007, one of the biggest uh, words that was searched on Google was program climate. I never watched it, but there was a, this was the biggest uh, search phrase, Google. And it's not clear whether that's the best way to spend the energy of yours. Uh, there is, uh, I don't know how many, perhaps you've heard about the mountain pine beetle in Canada. It's destroying forests. It's a tiny little five millimeter beetle going and eating through forests. And it is creating global warming that increases its eating life during the cycle of the year. It used to freeze to death because winters were longer, but now winters are shorter. Eating more pine, which means winters are going to become even shorter. So it is this five millimeter beetle could destroy mankind. Of course, they have, they have, uh, they've gone and it's one of the first insects for which they've done full DNA mapping. Not a worry, but you know, perhaps it would be more interesting to deploy IoT and try to find where, where this insect hatches and goes to the next tree. Because what happens is that they don't know which tree it is attacked. The tree it is attacked this year is green this year, but is red next year. So that's the way it works. So it, th there's a lot of ways that we can use data and analytics and IoT to actually affect human life instead of looking for, like, who the next American idol is or something. But um, what, what makes all our lives special is that we, we, as human beings, we have a life. It is limited in some way. I mean, see, uh, perhaps 100 years, this investor in uh, PayPal, Mr. Thiel, believes he's going to live 125 years in Silicon Valley. He's funding... Uh, Sort of an immortality drug startup. <laughs> you know, I was reading about this in the New Yorker. But what, what, what gives us special expertise is that we can see bends in the road, especially when you come to be my age. Uh, you know, you've seen something in the past, you've seen something in the future, but you're in some bend in the road. And that is what gives you strategic vision to. I'm not suggesting that the younger among you 
are not at a bend in the road. You're in your own bends in the road. You've seen something in the past, but you can imagine the future. And it's about practicality of that imagination. I think it's where our engineering expertise can actually bear fruit. Um, of course, in the 1980s, when I was a graduate student, and I wrote my master's thesis on an IBM PC, and it was a struggle. I ha at the very end, I had to pull the thesis out and write the formulas by hand. My PhD thesis, I could actually write all on the computer. I didn't need to write any formulas by hand. If I knew about Unix in 1980, things might have been different, but I didn't, really, I have to be honest. I'd only read about it, and I'd used it in Berkeley in one summer, but I didn't know what it was I was using. I just programmed some numerical analysis thing on it. Um, but I think the, what we are going towards is uh, that, you know, many years ago, paper was invented. It was a great technology. It uh, gave us great durability, great mobility, great user interface. It lasted for 2,000 years. And now, in the digital age, you know, I'm not suggesting books are going to disappear, although Hennessy, in uh, last year's Intel Global Capital talk, he said, they asked him, what is the biggest trend you see? He says, disappearance of books, digital books. I still love my paper books, but in any case, um, the fact is that a lot of the content is going to live on the cloud. You're generating them, and most people who are producing devices, including Huawei, when you buy one of these, something like this, in China you get unlimited uh, photo and video storage. And people are coming with unlimited storage. I don't think people have a lot of ideas about what what means, but, uh, you know, uh, that, that's going to happen. Uh, but the message I have is that algorithms actually do matter because they they determine how energy is spent. That avoiding that branching or misprediction is actually important. Um, and there might come a time where we have to choose which problems are most important to solve. We may not have the energy or the luxury to attack all problems. We might have to be more prudent and economical, the resources that we have, and focus on the problems that matter to humanity at large. So that's my talk. Uh, I, I thank you very much for bearing with me and listening to me. I hope I've inspired you a bit, maybe created some puzzles. Um, and if you want to know more about what uh, our lab does, Thank you very much. Uh, the question is, uh, the Google data, why was it off from the CDC actual data that had about disease? Google used all the data they had to do prediction, with particular emphasis on people's search. who come with search for a particular drug or particular ailment, <clears throat> and they would say, okay, it's going to be flu. <clears throat> uh, well, the... There could be many reasons. I'm not, I wasn't part of the flu prediction team. My guess is that their models were complex at one point. They simplified it, and then they made it more complex. Because if you look at it, in 2009, they mispredicted really badly. In 2010, they did okay. In 2013, they did badly again. So it is just different engineering team going through <laughs> through this thing and making, you know, every one of them coming in through the system. That's just my, um, I really don't 
Avenue. That's actually a very uh, good question, <clears throat> and I'm, the, our lab is actually active doing work in that area. One of the things that people have discovered when they did the IoT analysis, uh, like the McKinsey study, uh, they discovered that the most advanced users are actually um, <clears throat> mines, oil uh, exploration, and industries such as that. And they notice that all the data that they're collecting, which is uh, of various fidelity, they only use 1% of it, 1% of the data they've collected. And the focus is on discovering faults or you know, reacting to looking at the last slice. So I think when you look at the last slice of data, you can have very high fidelity, but you just cannot store that. So the question is, how do, you, um, how do you decide which pieces of it to keep? So there, there are people who do a lot of uh, image uh, processing now to try to find structure in images, select some of them. And then when you keep them, where would you put them? And how would you tag or index them? How would you search through those? In these, are, these are some of the questions that are Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.